Different time, but the same crew here on the One Soccer Hangouts. Adam Jenkins, Kurt Larson, Oliver Platt, and special guest today. He is a CPL champion. He has played and visited more countries than probably all of us combined. It is Kyle Becker, man of the world, man of great facial hair, and man on the hangout today. Kyle, welcome to the show, buddy. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. Practice that intro just for you, just so you know. I'm good. trying to pump the tires early, get you feeling yeah. good, loosen everything up. Can you just like follow me around and do that any room? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really expensive, just so you know, but um, I'll, you can get in touch with my agent. Our agents will talk, Kyle. Don't you worry yeah, about I'll it. Figure something out. Uh, we've been asking all of our guests when they come on the, po- the, the I was supposed to say podcast. This isn't quite a podcast yet, but on the hang of what they've been up to to pass the quarantine. So give us the rundown. Where are you at? Who are you holding up with? And what are some of the things you're doing to keep busy? Probably pretty, uh, pretty standard. Same as everyone across the board. From a, from a team side of things, they're doing a pretty good job of, of keeping us busy. We have uh, some home workouts, and obviously we've had to adjust that with the schedule constantly changing, but that's the, the reality of the situation. And then just crushing some Netflix, obviously went through the, the Tiger King phase, same as everyone else. Thoroughly enjoyed that. And then, yeah, just uh, just trying to keep busy, doing stuff, keep sandy, get outside as much as possible, walk around, and just try to make the best of the situation. Are you team free Joe Exotic or team Carol Baskin? Uh, no, definitely not Carol Baskin. I'm going to be pretty <laughs> honest, though. I thought it was pretty, pretty overhyped. I was shocked. I think, like, yeah. on a normal day to day, I would have loved it, but maybe because everyone was in on it, I just decided to hate it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I would lean on uh, Joe's, Joe's side of things. Okay. I think that's a popular decision. So, aside from Netflix, any new hobbies? Are you doing hair like your buddy on the team nanko or are you designing clothes are you woodworking <laughs> cross stitching what's what are you doing with all your free time cross stitching no nah, man uh, <laughs> nah, nothing too crazy man just uh just hanging out read a uh, read a little bit um yeah nothing too special i'm gonna be now, honest it hasn't, and- really, it hasn't really changed too much in my life i don't know what that <laughs> is about me. i feel that for sure yeah all are you practicing the french horn or taking up an instrument um no i tried a bit of yoga this morning can't, oh, please tell us more about that can't can't do that um <laughs> i can't touch my toes so i don't know what i was expecting but yeah that, that didn't go very well um other than that i'm much the same as kyle life hasn't changed that too much but i don't really do much as it is so yeah Kurt, please tell us you're the most interesting person in this four person panel because i'm i'm underwhelmed so far well i'm not well i am somewhat interesting uh but i also <laughs> I also tell the truth, and both these guys are completely 100% lying when they say this hasn't impacted them. Ollie was on here just a few weeks ago talking about how down and depressed he was, so I know this has impacted him, so he's not even telling you the truth. Um, But have I picked up any hobbies? Uh, The answer is no, and I have a a theory on why that is. I think a lot of people during normal times will tell you, oh, I I just need that little bit of extra time to take up playing the violin or to, to learn a second language. And oh, if I just had more time, I'd go to the gym and I'd work out more. None of it's true. And I know that because I haven't done anything extra to improve my life during this time. I've just done the same thing every day, despite having all the time in the world to go out and do whatever I want by myself. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I don't do much normally and I still don't do much. <laughs> I just kind of do that. <laughs> <laughs> watch tv and read books and yeah oh, and also going back to the going back to the tiger king thing i'm like i know kyle played in texas for a little bit that's actually near oklahoma uh so you know any i think you've, he's experienced quite a bit of that stuff, kind of stuff down there i think yeah i mean the, i wasn't really shocked by by the characters in the show the way that everyone else was it seemed pretty pretty standard um who be the most world. likely person on forge kyle to want a pet tiger Oh, Marcel, for sure. This guy watches like <laughs> animal fight videos all day and night. <laughs> like that. All right, hold on. What's your guilt? What's your guilty? What's your guilty, what's your guilty YouTube, everybody? What do you guys? What do you guys watch on there? Oh, I like God, a good is... live lounge, like uh, Radio yes, One. Yes, BBC Radio One. That's a good show. Yeah, um, live lounge is great. Um, I wanted to come up with something cool, but I really just watch like. I like blogs. So Peter McKinnon, um, the Minnesota Millennial Farmer, is just a thrilling oh, watch. <laughs> This one's for Ollie. This one's for Ollie. You know what I'm, you know what I've been watching, Ollie? And it's been a few years now. Uh, I actually go back and I watch Good Morning Britain clips of Piers Morgan. <laughs> Why would you do that? I like he's good. I like him. He's entertaining. I don't know. Uh, Every, enough, enough, 
Everyone right. in Britain was really happy when he got a job in America and we didn't have to really listen to him anymore. I liked him on CNN too. <laughs> yeah, not for me. It, so I followed okay. him. Okay. We will we'll work on getting Pierce Morgan on the show just for Kurt. I'm sure he's got some great mm-hmm. football takes right now. Yeah. Uh, let's get into a bit of news. I mean, we're hearing some more of the premiers talking about opening things up. I mean, Manitoba and PEI have sort of been leading the charge there. Doug Ford today on an audio radio show mentioned May 2-4 would be a great time to to sort of ease some of these restrictions. Ali, are you encouraged by any of that news? Um, no, not really. Like, I, I've just stopped reading and watching most of it. Um like it always seems as if when there's some kind of good news that maybe we can start to reopen and maybe the curve is flattening a little bit. There's also like a but associated with it. Like the prisons and care homes seem to be a bit of a mess. And then you have people saying, well, we might be let out, but then we're going to have to maybe go back in again if there's another outbreak. So I kind of have tuned out by now and I'm not getting my hopes up. It's interesting they've pinpointed like a holiday weekend for this. Like whatever happened, what, we've just abandoned the uh, the actual <laughs> yeah. like science. It's just, nah, you know what? The May, May 2 4 weekend sounds like it's probably the best thing. <laughs> Big Forge FC party, I'm sure, when uh, this whole thing gets underway. Speaking of Forge, Kyle, what uh, can you just sort of take us inside the locker room or the virtual locker room right now, just in terms of uh, you mentioned the at home workouts, but just how the players and coaches are staying in contact? And I mean, Ollie's doing yoga. Is Bobby leading four Jeff C yoga sessions now on Zoom? We actually, uh, we started doing a couple, or we've been doing uh, some Zoom workouts and like yoga in the morning, actually, just to keep guys engaged, keep guys talking. I think it was just like the the aspect of not being able to see each other, um, especially for guys who, who kind of are from overseas and don't necessarily have anything. I think it was a, a good idea from that side of things. And we have our coaching staff doing it too. So that's been pretty funny. Bobby tapped out pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's gonna like like me saying that, but yeah, he's uh he's slowed up on doing him. He's there. I don't really see him doing the exercises though anymore. That's right. He talks about you too. That's right. We'll get to that though. <laughs> Susp- suspicious camera angle where you can just sort of see Bobby. He's just laying down, but it looks like he's doing <laughs> downward dog or something. Yeah, he just puts his kid in front of it. He's doing all the work. <laughs> uh, well, I mentioned Chris Nanko earlier. I was joking about him. And, and cutting hair and if you've taken up barbering but has he ever actually cut your hair we did a one soccer story making the cut on his um his kicked up brand and everything there but has he ever actually cut your hair have you been brave enough to try it <laughs> you know what i actually let him cut my hair once and we were in edmonton and then we went on to have probably one of our worst games of the season so that was pretty much the end of that <laughs> the the perform I, i'm not going to say he hasn't improved but i think the performance matched up with the cut <laughs> Chris. Ali, you and I both have mentioned a few times that we're ready for a lot of this to come off. What would you be willing to to barter or to trade for Nanko to come over and give you a, a trim? Uh, he can take anything he wants at this point. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have that much to offer, but yeah, I'm, I, it's getting to the point where I'm going to, I'm, I'm considering let my girlfriend cut it in the hopes that she does a bad enough job that I can just buzz the rest of it off. Um, mm. ah, kind that's, of, that's good reverse psychology. Kind Why don't you just wear a hat, man? Why don't you just wear a hat? Why don't you try no, and come I'm not on a hat here? guy. I'm not a hat guy. Kurt, what is under that hat, by the way? Well, you wear, you wear a toque or you wear a different CPL hat every day. I'm just wondering what on earth you're hiding under there. Oh, I turned I turned the hat around today out of respect for, for Kyle Becker, for the guest. Um, Appreciate it. What's under here? Uh, it's getting a little bit long. I uh, got some wings coming out here over the ears. I'm not going to lie. I kind of fluff them out just a little bit because it adds that little bit of edge that I, that I like. So... Uh, <laughs> I could easily just tuck it behind the ear, but I leave it out there. So uh, it's growing. It's growing by the day, and we're happy to see it. We'll we'll see if we can get it pointed out further and further, Shrek style. By the end of this, which hat is that? What? Is that oh. is that a wonder? No, no, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it. Let's move on. Let's move. <laughs> let's move on here. Let's talk about champ. Let's talk about championships. Uh, okay, we we're about, shaking let's... everything out. Go ahead. Let's go. Yeah, let's talk about soccer here. Kyle, coming into this season, a lot was made of, of you coming back to Canada and, and, and the project here. Um, just given what you went through earlier in your career with, with struggles at TFC and, and, and that program not being anywhere near what it is, what it is now. Um, did anybody enjoy this championship? Did anybody feel as vindicated uh, about this championship as you? I don't know. I think, uh, I think across the board, I think, uh, we just had such a good group. And I think as the season went on, you saw us kind of really buying into what we were doing and it just became that much more enjoyable. And 
we were pretty connected. And then when we won, you just saw it in the celebration. Like we all enjoy hanging out with each other and that translates to what we're doing on the field and what we do off the field. So just made the party that much better. I don't know if, I don't know who liked it the most. I've heard, I've heard some people say different things, but I think we all had a pretty good time. Well, what we've been hearing is that you enjoyed it the most and you were the <laughs> prince of the party. Can you confirm or deny those allegations? I mean, I don't know what the, the actual stat is to prove who, who had the best time. But <laughs> I was pretty banged up for a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask you for a bottle count, but uh, we'll, we'll take that. That's, that's about as close as we're going to get. Um, Kyle, looking ahead to kind of next year, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time you've actually had a second year at a club since TFC. Um, I may be wrong there, but obviously you've had to move around. You've been in different leagues as well as different teams. How nice is it to actually be able to come back and, and have a second year with the same team and coach? Yeah, I think that that was a large part in me coming back in the first place to, to kind of get that consistency and, and solidify myself in a, in a situation and really be a part of something going forward. And then to have it kind of work out so well in the first year and really justify the decision in coming back, it's, it's that much better and it's just so much more exciting and I think uh, people have, have seen what we're trying to build and and I think we have a lot more to do but obviously the the success in the first year kind of justifies everything that Bobby's laid in place and and the people he's entrusted in, in going forward and to have such a, a massive core group coming back I think it's it's exciting all around. Mm -hmm. One of the people he's trusted is you I mean all wearing the captain's armband and, and being one of the faces and voices of this league what I wanted to ask you based off that is Last week, the big news was the, the formation or the beginnings of the creation of the, um, the Professional Football Association of Canada movement. I'm wondering what your involvement has been, if at all, and um, just what do you think of its creation overall? Listen, I think the landscape of, of sports in North America, you know this is inevitably going to happen. Whether now is the, the correct time, is I think it's just a matter of going about it the right way. Um, I think as players, yeah, we need a voice. We need to see at the table, but who knows? We'll see. We'll see how it happens, and we'll see the kind of the ref uh, the reflection within the league of of what guys want and and what they're looking for. But as of right now, I can only speak uh, speak about myself and our club and, and the situation we're in. And I think everything we've seen since day one, it's been very professional. They've had our backs, and 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 we're in a very very good situation, and we're lucky to be there. But um, I think down the line. I it's definitely something that will, will gain some steam. And I think, honestly, I think everyone will be, be okay with it. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I completely agree that it was inevitable this soon. Um, no, I didn't mean that by any, any means. I just meant like sports in North America, every other league we've seen it. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody saw it coming, right? I think one, one thing that's obviously surprised uh, people at the league level is, is how uh, it, it was launched, you know, before this, the second season started. Um, but what do you, I mean, just, I, I guess you could go team to team almost. And based on people's experiences and players' experiences within their own clubs, they might feel differently about either having a union or not. But, uh, do you think the, the majority of your teammates would, uh, support a union initiative right now? It's honestly tough to speak to that because I can only think about it myself. And this is such an individual question, right? When you're, when you want to sign something like this, I think you actually have to think long and hard of what it means for you as a, as an individual, what your plan is for the future, how long you want to be a part of this league. Are you trying to take off? Do you really even care? Um, I don't think you can look to someone else to make an answer. Uh, and I think that's the big part of it. I think guys need to know what, what people are trying to get in place and what they actually want to achieve with it before they make a decision. And yeah, it's tough. I mean, certain guys have probably never had any any experience with the union before certain guys probably don't even know what it is, what it even means, what it entails. So I think it's a matter of making sure all that's out there. All that information is, is there and available for every player in this league to, to make an educated decision. Is there a, sorry, was there a union with the, uh, the NASL when you were there for, uh, for a little no, bit? No. A place was just kangaroo court. It was just yeah. Like, well, that's what I was, <laughs> that's, that's what I was wondering, man. It's like, uh, as soon as a, a club gets dissolved out West and the West coast with the deltas, you know, yeah. That process must have been wild without anybody out there. <laughs> Please, that was that was something else. But... <laughs> it's it's Kurt. It's funny you mentioned the Deltas because that's something we want to eventually circle back to if we have time. But Kyle, I, I want to move a little bit more through your career, sort of not necessarily chronologically because there's quite frankly not enough time to get into everything. But going back to the very beginning and and you as a younger player, I'm wondering. 
your time with Ajax, and obviously there were some immigration issues that prevented you from staying there. But I wanted to know if you could touch on what that experience in the Netherlands was like and how much you think your career would have been different if everything worked out, the permits, the passports, the visas, whatever you needed to stay was there. So what was it like and what do you think it could have turned into if everything turned up sunshine and roses? I mean, obviously, it's, there's a lot of speculation behind that, so there's really no no way. Who knows? Maybe I would have got my thing and just fell right on my face and, and ended up in the same situation. But uh, honestly, for me at that time, it was it was eye-opening. It was um, when you're that young, you're a little naive, especially in Canada. All you want to do is play soccer. You want to go over to Europe. You want this opportunity. And then for it to actually come and, and to be a part of it, it was – I just tried to take in as much of the experience as possible and just see how these kids just – eat, sleep, breathe soccer and, and do it all day. And they have that passion that we don't necessarily see fully across the board growing up in, in Canada. Yeah, you play with some very talented guys, but when you don't have that that goal at the end of the day, that professional team that you're you're supporting, you want to play for, you're working towards, it's hard to, to make it a reality. And everything was about getting out of here, doing it on your own. So to just see that um, was unbelievable. Obviously, it was tough to come back, but that was the reality of the situation. Um, but again, it was, it was a huge experience for me because I just got to see how it was done at the highest level at that time. Did you ever try and get overseas any other times throughout your career? I, mean, I always like to ask experienced and veteran players about maybe the opportunities they didn't take or maybe the, the, the overseas deals that almost went through but didn't quite go through. Did you ever try and, and, and get back over there or were you just uh, focused on staying in North America? Yeah, there's one or two more opportunities where I where I took the chance. Um, the obviously the other one was I actually before the combine I went over to to England and I traded with Crystal Palace while they were still in the championship. Whether that was actually a, a feasible situation or not, who knows? But that was another one where it was where it was fantastic for me, especially leading into that combine. I think it gave me a lot of confidence to do well. Um, obviously, as we know, it it didn't work out, but it kind of pushed me on to be like, hey. If, if I can compete there, I can I can definitely do something uh, here in North America. Have they gotten rid of the combine now, Oliver Platt? Does that still exist in MLS? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I just, I'm, no, I don't. I, mean, I think it's still there. They still play like the uh, the friendly games, right, where they have full teams or whatever. Of, is it? I thought they might have got rid of that. Any, anyway, maybe. so uh, Beck, Kyle, what, what was what was the combine process like? I mean, is it is it is it as strange as it seems uh, to the people on the outside to somebody like me who might have covered it a few times? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, you, you get thrown into the situation and I'm kind of a little, little more reserved and, and shy in those situations. You're just playing with a bunch of kids where you honestly probably have never even seen any of these guys in your college career if they're not in your conference or anything like that. And everyone's just trying to put their best foot forward. And you obviously get a couple of characters out of there who think they're the best thing that's ever happened to the game people like to talk a lot. So I kind of just went in shy and, and just tried to try to do my business and it was decent for me, but it is, especially in the game of soccer, you're going, you're playing, what is it? Like four friendlies with a bunch of guys you've never played before. And it's like, all right, how are we all going to show our showcase ourselves and, and be successful. And then you inevitably end up with a bunch of clowns just trying to dribble everyone doing seven step overs in the back. But who knows? Was that I, the, uh, I find the NFL combine more interesting where you get to watch some linemen bench press 225 pounds <laughs> as many times as possible. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, it's just so so much different, right? That's kind of a staple, and those guys are all just absolute specimens. Yeah. So to just see them do that is is unbelievable. But no one wants to see right. Al Becker do a vertical test. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> Don't say that. I think there'd be great numbers. Oh, on your that. your career could have gone in a number of ways. <laughs> <laughs> what is your vert? Do you know it? Uh, put a piece of paper on the ground. That's it. <laughs> It's funny that we um, we sort of mentioned the the fork in the road moment and, and you speculate about what might have been and obviously there's no way to really know but I'm curious to hear from Ollie and Kurt on this one too. Was there a moment in your careers where maybe there's a job opportunity in a different country or a different team, a different league and and you could have gone left but you went right and now here you are. Do you reflect on any of those? Ollie, I'll get your take first. Um, I'd probably have to say coming back to Canada. Um, like I, there's no real skill involved in that. I just got completely lucky that I came back at a time where TFC were taking off and, and suddenly becoming this model franchise that was attracting a lot of attention and winning a lot of trophies. And I got to cover that team. And then, you know, I fall into the launch of the CPL, right? So it's, yeah, as I said, I don't want to attribute any kind of great vision or sort of skill to it because it was mostly luck. But um, 
yeah, that decision definitely changed a lot for me for sure. So I'd have to say that. What's that? Uh, what's that meme that from the show? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, where he's got the the map and there's all those lines coming out from it. That's kind of what like uh, what's going through my mind right now. Um, so my fork, I could go a lot of different ways with this. First of all, just ending up at the Toronto Sun, which started kind of my soccer um, journalism career. That that was an interesting fork, and then to the CPL, and then eventually here to One Soccer. Uh, but I'm going to go further back than that, and that was the, the fork was when I told my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, that I wanted to uh, come back to Canada with her after we graduated school in the states. Uh, what would have happened to me otherwise? Probably would have gone back to Kansas City. Uh, a lot more Bud Lights, a lot more barbecue, probably a, a lot, a lot more weight gain. <laughs> You're doing a good job keeping the weight off now in quarantine, though, Kurt. Oh uh, yeah, I only drink, uh, you know. Mill Street Organics now, so. Uh, oh, we switched from Nickelodeon yeah, to Mill Street. Yeah, That's keep, breaking well, news. Yeah. Don't so. slide that under the rug. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, you spent four years in, in at Boston College. That's not news to you, but for people who may not know your story, that's maybe news to them. And certainly a, a great career for you there with the Eagles. I mean, top 10 in, I think it's points, goals, and assists still, and one of the captains in your senior year. So I want to talk about that college experience because right now there's a lot of people who aren't necessarily getting that college experience or it's altered, spring season's being canceled, deferrals. There's so much going on in the NCAA right now. But instead of sort of taking that big picture of you, I want to ask you more specifically, what do you remember the most from your time with the Eagles? Marathon Monday. It's probably the greatest, <laughs> greatest part. And, and of for people who may not be familiar with Marathon Monday, please elaborate. Are yes, you familiar the, with it? The Boston, the Boston Marathon runs like right in front of our oh, campus okay. and it's just chaos for a full day. So it's pretty good. <laughs> good. What's one particular highlight from Marathon Monday then? If you could pick. I don't really know. It's a whole blur. I think the, the first time, well, actually I have one that's pretty good. It kind of sums it all up. So my first year there, obviously being Canadian like just finding out the whole dynamic how different it is from like an American high school experience to a Canadian high school experience and then just the whole culture around around college once you get there and seeing everyone who thinks they know how to how to drink and party and do all this stuff and it's kind of just like commonplace for for a bunch of us and then BC is a it's a private institution it's not as like it's not a massive party school and the whole year everyone's just talking about marathon Monday marathon Monday just wait like you're going to change your mind I'm like okay whatever and then, so the, the day finally comes down. And it's one of those ones where you're up at like seven in the morning and everyone's just already real fired up. And we're walking through where all the seniors lived and this guy just sl uh, opens a sliding door and he flies out in this like full cow costume. And I think honestly, it's like seven, seven fifteen in the morning and he's just yammy and outside of his dorm. I just started dying laughing. I was like, all right, this is going to be interesting. And it did not disappoint. <laughs> God, I would have hated to go to a school where they just talk about one day of partying and they make you wait six months for it. Oh, tell me about it. But surprisingly, <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. Like, uh, it actually, it actually was a, a great experience. I've, I've no, uh, no regrets going there. I think it was a great group of guys, and, and we had a lot of fun. On a bit of a more serious note, just mentioning the cancellation of the spring season for a lot of people i'm wondering I've, I've sort of had this in the back of my head where if you were a graduating senior that year you had you had done sort of you were in your fourth year of academics but the ncaa all of a sudden gives you another year would you have been more tempted to take that year as a college student enjoy that lifestyle a little bit more versus saying no i'm ready for the pros get me into the draft now like which direction do you think you would have taken if you were in that situation me personally i would have left right away i wouldn't have gone back just to just to tear it up for a semester. I think, uh, yeah, just where I was, if, if I had the chance to, to continue my career, uh, there's, that's a no brainer. I was so done with college. I had a red shirt and I, I, I still got out of there. I left as soon as I could. I couldn't wait to be done with college. And I wasn't going to the pros. I was becoming, <laughs> I was becoming professional in something else. Maybe if you had a marathon Monday, Kurt, you would have changed your mind. <laughs> every day was Mary. Every, every week was marathon Monday for me, buddy. <laughs> well, that does lead me to my next question for the two of you, not on, well, for Ollie, not on an athletic scholarship at the same level necessarily. That's not a jab, by the way, whoa, but I'm so, whoa, whoa. <laughs> sorry, were you not, or sorry, you were playing ice hockey, weren't you? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, carry on. Okay. I, so, okay. I want to make sure I wasn't missing a glaring detail. I didn't want to disrespect <laughs> your name like that. What do you miss the most and the least about college, Ollie? Um, well, like Kurt said, like I really enjoyed college, but I wasn't sad to leave. Like I was pretty much ready it was done and, and ready to go um i would say i miss 
miss the least i would say the food um like you, you know how some people have that thing where they have a night out where they get like blackout drunk on one particular drink and then they can never so much as smell that drink again Jaeger, yes. you know i'm talking about um, <laughs> like i have that with instant noodles um just based on my oh. first year of diet uh, in in college so i don't miss the food um what do i miss i i would say like i miss having the opportunity to this is going to sound incredibly boring but to, to study something i guess like i thought when pep guardiola left Barcelona and took that like one year long sabbatical I thought he had the right idea of, of how to live uh, it's taken a year to do whatever you want basically mm-hmm. Kurt for you I can I can tell we're like six weeks into this now because I just had Oliver Platt tell me about being blackout drunk which no, I never thought I was kind of you know using it okay I was using it it wasn't it wasn't you it wasn't you that was blackout drunk it was everybody else yeah. Yeah. only okay. on only on uh, Instagram oh, okay yeah. uh the best um so for the best, I'm going to go with, uh, so it's free for us to go to all the basketball games, right? So I don't know if, if at Boston College, Kyle, if, if the basketball games were free for the students, but at Drake, uh, a nice little private school in the Missouri Valley Conference, we got to go to all the basketball games for free because um, we weren't that good. So there wasn't a big raffle for tickets or anything, and you, you didn't have to fight for spots. However, by my senior year, we were very good and went to the NCAA tournament. So I remember that entire year, uh, we beat Iowa State, we beat Iowa, we, we beat Creighton, all these, all these traditionally good basketball schools. So it was fun just to be a part of that experience uh, where your school goes to the NCAA tournament once every you know, two decades or three decades, and uh, you get to, to experience that. The worst, um, my worst would be a soccer experience that was coming into my first preseason completely out of shape, probably 15 pounds overweight, having no idea what it was going to take to actually make the jump from a high school level to a college level. Apparently being one of the best players in Kansas didn't exactly translate to the NCAA level. Uh, So it took me two years to realize that and get fully fit and uh, finally become a regular player on the team. Kyle, being a student athlete is not an easy thing Uh, for people who have not had to juggle college and being basically a semi-professional athlete. It's, it's a lot of time management. It's a lot of studying when you want to be sleeping or practicing when you want to be sleeping. But aside from that aspect of it, what's the most overrated and underrated aspects of being a, an NCAA student athlete? Overrated. Oh, man, that's tough. Overrated aspect of it? I don't know. That's uh, Honestly, I wouldn't, like, just in my experience, I don't think it went too much either way. I think it was all kind of just we all just took it as it as it came I don't think anyone on our team was that overwhelmed with everything that was going on I don't know if that's a testament to to the program and and the the support system we had in place or not or if I just didn't really care and maybe I was just (laughs) I'm the outlier who knows um I don't really know man I guess uh yeah I don't have a real answer for that one so I think underrated for me would be just kind of the locker room, the, the, the teammates, the long bus trips, stuff like that. So that would be what you can't really explain to somebody on the outside if, if, or, yeah. or somebody who hasn't really experienced that kind of tight-knit locker room culture. Yeah, I'd agree with that, actually. It's the same thing as, as you hear, like, stories when guys retire. The, the one thing they miss the most is, is hanging out with the boys and, and all the away trips and, and just traveling and, and that, like, time you guys have to each other. And yeah, people like to be people like to be around other people who have had similar life experiences, right? So even if it's not in, if it's not in sports, people who have experienced similar work or or similar travel, you like to be around people who have experienced the same things as you because you can talk about them. I, I would not include the bus trips in that. Like Jesus, I hated those. Ah, oh, it's a legendary. There's some legendary bus stuff. What what goes on at the back of the bus? Oh, maybe it's because we were losing like fifteen zero in most games, but yeah, they, they, okay. <laughs> well. Not all of us were think, abnormally large losers. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we have time to unpack that one, Ollie. Maybe, uh, maybe that's for a Friday show. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, let's move on from Boston College to TFC now and starting with the Super Bowl. Oh, one second, one second, one second, okay. one second. I wanted to get this in. I didn't know where to fit it in. Kyle, do you remember losing to Drake University your freshman year 6 4 in the NCAA tournament? If you think I'm going to forget that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still. So here's here's funny. I I still have teammates, and maybe not recently, but as early as a few years ago, who 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 said, if you ever see Kyle Becker, remind him that we got the better of him on that day. So it was unbelievable! It was, I think they scored six set pieces. 
three might have <laughs> even been like free kicks from the halfway line that we just absolutely could not handle. It was shocking. But, I went back. We went. We, we went back and read the match report. I think you scored that game too. So I'm going to give you your due. Was, was that an upset? I'm assuming. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Big big man move, by the way, to bring that up on a virtual hangout when you're not in studio together. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't even, I wasn't even playing. It was just my. I graduated the year before, so I happened to still be like. So they just you know, got significantly better in that year. Yeah. I mean, I got, <laughs> I'm the like I'm the I'm the first and and my coach was at my wedding. My coach gave a speech to my wedding, so we we know how we feel about each other. But I'm the first one to say that my coach was not that sad to have to to, to see me give up my scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> a little salt in the wounds and a little self-deprecation. That's the way to do it. Okay, can we go to TFC now, Kurt? Do I have your blessing? Please. Thank you very much. Okay, so 2013, you're taken third overall by TFC in that super draft. Before we get into your experience, your former teammate, Emery Welshman, was in that draft. Pop quiz, Kyle. Do you remember where Emery was taken? Was it like nine? Seven? Not a lottery pick? Come on, man. He's not a lottery pick, is he? Can't remember, man. Sorry. 16 for Mr. Welshman. That's okay. Uh -huh. There's a lot of questions here, so you just need a passing grade on this hangout. We're not going to hold it against you. Who was first and second? Uh, Andrew Farrell. Oh, yeah. Um, we went over this. Man, I don't know who went second. Kurt, yeah, this is your time to shine. You were bragging yesterday how much you love draft quizzes. Carlos Alvarez. Overrated. Uh, uh, where are you supposed going? To, uh, was, went to Connecticut. You might have. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I played against him for four years. Yeah, Kakuta Mane was fourth. Eric Hurtado fifth. Deshaun Brown sixth. It was actually... I think Oliver, you, Oliver, you, Oliver, you called it a bad draft. I think it was actually solid. Walker Zimmerman seven, like yeah. Ryan Finley nine, not, Eric Zavalet. Like that's it's a not good bad. draft. It's not a bad top ten. That's a good draft. Kurt, do you remember who was taking twenty eighth in that draft? Twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. And do you know? I do know. No, I don't know why. You you wouldn't know. It's Drew Becky, brother of Janine Becky, who is oh, on okay. One Soccer oh, Happy yeah. Hour tonight with Andy Shout Petrello out. at five Shout thirty. Out. Shout that, out. It's how you host a podcast. Or, uh, I keep on in a podcast. That's not how you host a podcast. You got to know the type of show you're doing. Okay. Oh, shout out. Um, yeah. Ollie, I think you wanted to take the next one with Kyle and sort of walk him down uh, the path of the draft in the, in the bigger yeah, yeah. So I'd be interested to know, Kyle, now that MLS obviously offers a lot more in terms of academy development versus going the college route. If you were a teenager now, what path do you think you would take to, towards the pros? Would it be still college and, and draft or would you prefer to go academy to pro? That's, that's tough. I think, again, it's, it's so much, it's, it's based on the individual, right? It's, you obviously have, it comes down to what's important to you and, and where you think your value lays. But if you can be in one of these systems where you're getting that pro environment and you're getting those, those top level training sessions and, and you're, you're furthering your development, then obviously that's the best, that's the best situation for you. But there's going to come a point when you make that transition into, into playing first team football where, I think where the MLS has kind of struggled for the North American player just in recent years and, and how much they've blown up and, and how good it's gotten um, is guys can go a year, two years without playing a game yeah. with no reserve league in place and, and all that, whether their team isn't necessarily competing in that, in that USL and they're kind of going with the, the 17, 16 year old kids. It's tough. So obviously now with the CPL that is massive for, for a lot of kids. Right. So if you can, if you can find that good area of development, I'd say you want to be in those academy systems. You want to be with the, with the best teams, with the best players, wherever that may be. I'm not really sure if I have an exact answer for it, but you want to be in the best situation, right? You want to be competing every single day in, in training with the best, uh, best of the best in your area. And then it just hits a, po it hits a point where guys need those competitive minutes. And I think we've, we've seen how beneficial that can be in this last year of the CPL where you, you see someone like Tristan Bor Borges, who is, by all accounts, fallen by the wayside the last few years in, in terms of the system here, but you give them meaningful minutes and, and you see what you can do. Yeah. I want to talk about 2013 TFC just a little bit, and, and we'll talk about you in particular in that squad, but can you just reflect back for us on, on some of the bad years at TFC? I mean, you, you hired a coach who was still playing professionally overseas. I mean, it, it was not you, but Kevin Payne did, right? It's, was it as bizarre on the inside as it was on the outside? 
That first year, yeah, definitely. And and going into it and, and knowing a few of the younger Canadian guys who'd been there for a few years, like an Ashton Morgan or a Daniil, Daniil Henry, you, you hear all these horror stories and then you believe that it's getting better and all this stuff. And and in that 2013 year, I think it was still a whole bunch of the chaos that the, that the outside saw. And it was much like much like it was on the inside. I mean, just in the way they got fired was was chaos. I mean, we guys came into training and there was a security guard standing in front of their locker saying, get out of here to the, to an entire coaching staff. It's like, you witness that and it's like, what is going on? But in the same, in the same breath, the, the following year and in, in bringing in Michael Bradley, I think you saw things change. I think he was, he was a massive reason why a lot of that changed. It was still obviously tough times in the, in those next two years, but I think they started laying the groundwork for, for things to move forward. Can you tell me a little bit more about the security guard situation? Are you, was it when Paul Mariner was being dismissed from the team? Were you in, were you in the locker room? Were you asking the security guard to step aside or what was going on? No, man, it was uh, Ryan Nelson and, and Jimmy and all those guys. Oh, the next year, 2014 or yeah. so? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So halfway. Yeah. Halfway. Okay. Yeah, that's what. That's oh, what. boy. Uh, okay. Um, well, for, from, from you, per, for you personally, um, did, did, did you get a fair shake? Uh, you know, was it a good environment to be drafted into just the players that were around you? Do you ever think about how maybe if you were drafted to a team that wasn't among the worst in the league, things could have been different for you in those first few seasons in MLS? I mean, you're the kind of player who I would think would need players around him, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's a difficult question because you could, when you look at it, now or you look at it from the outside it's it could have easily have gone either way right you could be like oh you're a young guy going into a situation where there is a little bit of this chaos maybe you're going to land into a coach who's just gonna be like you're going to play every single game we're going to go young we're going to do all this stuff and then it would by all accounts would have been great but it was just so many moving pieces there was it was tough for guys to get a to get a footing um or for myself personally and then obviously with all that in your first year it's it's tough to kind of find that guy who's going to be the leader who's going to say kind of take you under his wing and say this is how it's got to go these are these are the, the bumps and the bruises you're going to get along the way but it'll all be all be good in the end we have time for a national team question there uh mr host suppose so but make it quick <laughs> yeah just can Looking back at the roster for the 2013 Gold Cup and, and just what's your take on, you know, from, from then to now, just the, 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 maybe the improvement in the team, the, the guys on that team now. Um, what, what, do you, what do you have to say about maybe those, the, the, those days when you were on the national team? I mean, I'm a firm believer we've always had talent. It's just for whatever reason, we could never figure it out as a, as a team in terms of in, in a competition. And I don't know whether that's coming from, staff or if it's just all of us kind of coming together and being a little bit more competitive in the game and just making something happen and then getting that confidence and, and have it keep rolling because it just felt like we were always right there and then something would go our, wouldn't go our way the ball wouldn't bounce our way and then it was just like a full collapse but if you look at those players I mean like the likes of Atiba Hutchinson to never really achieve what he should have achieved at the national level is it's a shame because that guy is unbelievable. And I don't think I can say enough good things about the, the guy as a professional, the, the talent he's had, what he's done for Canada. And I don't think a lot, the sad thing is I don't think a lot of young Canadians even know who he is, which yeah. to me is a little mind blown. But now it's there's the exciting talent that we've, we have coming through. It's, it's fantastic. And hopefully we can get it right. And I think we've shown signs of getting it right to, to make that jump and, and make us a, a competitive nation. You were called in by Floro at least once, right? Weren't you? Uh, yeah, Benito. Yeah. What was, yeah, I've heard different things about this being in Benito's camp. I mean, we had Nick Ledgerwood on here a few weeks ago. He was telling us some kind of wild stories about working on throw-ins for two hours of training. And what can you tell us about, uh, you know, I don't, we'll stay away from the current group, but maybe past groups. What can you tell us about, you know, the national team under Benito Florida? Because I've heard interesting things, man. Yeah, I mean, he was he was definitely a funny guy. That's for sure. Um I think a lot of the, the negative stuff is just to be said about how the environment that he was brought in. And then there's a lot, it seemed like there was always a lot of stuff behind the scenes that was kind of holding him back. So whether he didn't necessarily trust the people around him and it became this constant tension within like a coaching staff that kind of went on to us, but yeah, he was, he was just a, a goofy guy. The funniest part was like Ledger would said, we'd, we'd work on throw-ins for so long and we do video and all this stuff. And, 
And I think a massive part of it was he could never really get the message across yeah, I've heard that, as efficient yeah. as possible. So that kind of just slowed things down. But then we'd all kind of get to a point where we'd be like, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. So it was just, I don't know. I think if you if you put a few other people around him that he could have that he could have trusted, it, it could have been a better situation. But I mean, there's some there's some funny stuff, man. I think we right. a full gold cup, and he was rocking like one of those like fisherman hats, like, covering <laughs> his neck up like the whole training camp. So he was just just a character. He was a very nice guy, and and he trusted, he wanted to do to do well, and I think he he had some great ideas for the national team. But whether the timing was right or the people, his support staff was might have been a might have been a miss. Who knows? We'll have I to remember do before, full one, one more thing, one more thing, okay. one more, one more, one more Benito Take it up story. With Kyle after. One more Benito <laughs> story. Uh, I remember, I think in like this guy's out of his mind when it was, uh, I believe it was 2018 World Cup qualifying. Would that make sense, Oliver? If he wouldn't that make sense? 2018? Yeah, that was his last cycle, right? Yeah, so he it would have ended in like 2016, I guess. But we're down in Mexico City and Canada had just lost. 3-0 at BC Place to Mexico like four days earlier. And then I went on the trip down to Mexico City covering it for the, the sun. And I was really excited because I was going to get this uh, exclusive inter interview with, with the head coach, Benito, the day before they're playing Mexico at the Azteca. So I'm like, all right, this could be interesting. So I sit. he sits down and uh, he goes over kind of the, the, the plan and everything. It doesn't, doesn't really make that much sense to me. And I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to sort through what, what his game plan is. And then at the end of it, he just kind of looks, looks at me and he says, he repeats this. He, he repeats this. He just goes, remember impossible is nothing. And he repeated it. And I'm like, he, he was trying to say that it's that winning the next day was absolutely possible. Uh, and then of course the next day they started by giving away a penalty, basically 15 minutes into the game. And it was good night for Canada, but impossible is nothing is, is what I vision when I see him. Yeah, I mean, he, he definitely loved a good quote. And again, I think a bunch of the problems just became from it was, it was just lost in translation. So I think if it could have been much different, but I mean, he was a great guy. He, he treated everyone with a lot of respect. He wanted the best for us. And for whatever reason, it just I had nothing, I had nothing but good run ins with him. So don't, uh, don't Liverpool have a throw in coach now? Maybe he was ahead of his time in, in that regard. Oh, they'll be coming for Nico Pesquati at any moment. <laughs> Hey Kyle, awesome. is that a, Kyle, is that an illegal throw-in? Nico Pasquati's throwing? Yeah, absolutely. If you're stuck <laughs> over the line, or you're twisting sideways and basically throwing it with one arm, show me how that's not. <laughs> Listen to this. If I did the same thing in the league, you're calling that guaranteed every single time. Saying the league has do, it do out for you. Do we have time to dive into the throw-in controversy? I think we need a lot <laughs> yeah, more than money to hold it right there. <laughs> it, don't get me wrong it's effective and it is it's terrible to, to well, kyle maybe if you wouldn't elbow people in the face yeah. people wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> okay low That's blow a, larson yeah, come was, on uh, now show yeah, some oliver, respect oliver, to oliver, platt, oliver platt still says it wasn't an elbow so i'm gonna so i'll i'll, I'll in the green one yeah. well yeah I, I was on the sideline that game so i was right behind di chiara and i didn't think there was much contact now admittedly Carl, when i watched the replay it did look a little worse so i'm kind of yeah, torn on it now it. but <laughs> but my first my first live viewing i i was i was siding with you yeah okay we have to move on now we'll we'll have uh, lloyd and or work on the impossible is nothing <laughs> one soccer story on benito floral but for now <laughs> let's get back to uh the cpl <laughs> Interestingly, Becker, every single player we've had on this show in the unofficial One Soccer Player Awards, they've given you the MVP honor. So now that Tristan Borges is out of the country, do you agree with them? Were you the MVP last year? No, man, it was Borges. Absolutely. Um, getting to work with the guy every single day and then just seeing what he was able to produce on the field. He's fantastic talent. I think uh, when you put up numbers like that, you deserve it. Yeah, that was the professional answer I expected from you. But I don't think you can disagree that you two were the best one-two duo in all of the CPL last season. So we, we actually had the three guests today, the two analysts and Kyle, do a little bit of homework. And I asked them to come up with, or we asked them to come up with, their best duos of all time. The top three could be sports, could be business, could be music, could be anything. But the top three duos inspired by the uh becker borges duo from last season so we are going to get into that now i will judge the best set of duos I'll go on twitter have your say as well vote on who you think has the best duos as well but i'll let ollie go first 
or sorry, I'll uh, let uh, Kyle go first because he's yeah, the guest. I don't go first, so, so Kyle, you give us your top three duos of all time. Three? I thought we were just giving one. Well, yeah, I, I don't want to go first because I've done the homework wrong and I've only got one. Yeah, so we're going one or three. <laughs> okay, since you only prepared one, let's only go yeah. one. But they have all to be right, a good so. Throw them out there. I'm, throwing, I'm giving two. I don't care what you say. <laughs> all right, I'll go. I'll go two as well, just to throw in a throw in a soccer one. Um, so the first one I had, I went with uh, Farley and Spade. Gone too soon. Wow. I made some magic. That's so good. I went like with that those show. guys off, actually. The, off the bat. Adam, Adam, do you know who they are? I do care. I'm young, Kurt, but I'm not that young. Show some oh, okay. respect. Come on now. Come on now. That's a good show, Kyle. Adam. What uh, what's your soccer duel? I'll go uh Burr Camp and Henri. Nice. Yeah, okay, good. Ollie, follow that one up. I stayed away from soccer. I'm sick of soccer. Uh, mine is soccer. I, I've kind of twisted the question a little bit, and I've gone with a duo in a different sense, uh, in the sense that they were great competitors and actually hated each other. Um, but they were essentially, in my opinion, um, the story of the Premier League through my childhood, and that was Roy Keane and Patrick Vieira. They are my best duo. Um I was watching some stuff recently about them, actually, and, and Roy Keane said that he actually, on a Monday before they played Arsenal, he'd start to feel physical pain because he knew he was going to suffer that following weekend when he went up against Vieira. So, um, Adam, you're not going to Adam, you're not going to stand for this, are you? He's this, listing this them a, as a duo. This is a kind I'm, of awesome I'm kind listening of awesome. to everyone's you arguments. Come on, <laughs> you love rivalries. Come on. Yeah, they would be a good rivalry. Yeah, they're a duo. Okay. Oh, well, we're getting into semantics again. Okay, we're not. We no done. semantic arguments, gentlemen. Mm. Come on now, Larson. What's your What's your selection? Uh, I went with a, with a uh, uh, one one movie duo. Uh, my movie duo is from my one of my favorite trilogies, if not my favorite trilogy. I'm going with Marty McFly and Doc Brown. Uh, and for my athletes, uh, shout out to producer Kyle. I'm going with Carl Malone and John Stockton. Okay. No, no. I was expecting one Jordan Pippen comment from everyone, especially with no, the last dance being popular right nah, now. That's we'll too obvious. Come on. I, see, I'm just saying I'm glad that no one went there because then I would have had to judge more harshly. Um, one question from me, and this is an absolute chance for you guys. To I, have one more. I, also, I also have one more. Oh, you have I also more. have one more. You have one more. No, I'm going to wait. No, this one's outside of the vote, though. I want you to vote on the best duo first. Okay. Um, you all missed the best duo of all time, which is Maverick and Goose, but we don't have time to debate how wrong you all are for not mentioning that. But I'm going to have to give it to Becker. I liked uh, the Farley and Spade show, and this is also just a bit of slight on Kurt for accusing me of not knowing who they were. That's ageism, Kurt. I know. I asked you. If, I asked you if you knew. I didn't accuse you of not knowing. But it, but it was a little snarky. Come on. It was. We know where you were going through. Okay, yeah. so we have our official winner, Kyle Becker. <laughs> give us your best duos on Twitter, at one soccer. I think Armin's well, going to tweet something out, our digital I'm, social coordinator extraordinaire. But Kurt, give us your other one now take us out of this debate well, he is not part of the best duo in the cpl uh it is not kyle becker and tristan borges it is actually bobby and constantine smirniotis are the best duo in the cpl based on what they've done for canadian soccer and bringing a championship to hamilton what say you kyle becker got no complaints it's an all cav team right there <laughs> They might have the biggest calves in the in the staff of well, all of the league. Let's all right. So let's let's expand on that just for a second here. Has there is has anybody done more to develop players for the highest level in Canada than those two? Are you leaving that to me to answer? I'm leaving it to you. I'm just thinking about all the players. I mean, how many national team appearances do players who have come through their system have? Right. That's where I'm getting at. Listen, obviously, I'm a little biased because I've seen it and I've seen how it works and, and how effective it is. But the one question that I kind of asked myself over the over the years and then now coming back, uh, I've been asking it a lot this year is how has no one just come in and essentially copied the entire landscape to broaden this across Canada? Like, clearly it works. They have something. They know stuff. Why are, why haven't people been picking their brains or or go into the, the coaching staff that they have at the, at the youth levels and be like, listen, what are you doing that is so successful? Like, what is your, what is your guys' goal? Like, what do you do to achieve this? How do you go about it? Because in, in the broader picture in, of Canada, it's like we're all in this together. Like, we want to share these, these ideas, right? We want the best for, for our youth to come up and keep developing and getting better and, and producing these players like we're starting to see in the national team right now. So 
I don't know. I, I don't know why it, why it's not common knowledge. Why are they not being used as a as a resource? Why we're we not celebrating it more? But. Can you give me so just as somebody who who grew up in the U.S. system and, and everything like that? Can you give me any insight into how you think they've managed to develop so many players? And can you take me inside a training session as a teenager? And 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 what can you tell me just briefly? I mean, it sounds super obvious, but it's taken away all the all the garbage, this stuff that we're seeing on social media now these days, all these these flicks and, and all like the pageantry behind it. It's going down to basics. It's it's kids who are learning the fundamentals at a at a young age, studying the game, knowing all the ins and outs, and and being trusted to kind of take that into the into the game format. So when you see these training sessions, there's I could see a whole bunch of parents probably being like, What are we doing? They they're not doing anything. Like they're doing the same passing drill, receiving the ball with the inside of the foot, receiving the ball with the outside of the foot, all these little fundamental things. But you're learning at such a young age where you're so comfortable on the ball. And then, you, like, for me, for example, when I was growing up, we'd go over, if I was lucky enough to go over to Europe with a, sort of like a select team and we do it, we'd get blown out of the water because these kids were so professional. They were so drilled in, in everything they did. Whereas it was kind of for us, it was just roll the ball out and go play. But they know all the basics. They know all the ins and outs, and and they study them week in and week out. And it's a, a very competitive environment. And you see these kids thrive in it. They want to win. They want to get better. And and I think it's we've seen how it's grown over the years. So hopefully, it can only get better. Cool. Can you just uh, elaborate on that dynamic between you and Bobby a little bit further? What's that relationship like? Is it a little bit like big brother, little brother? Is he like the karate sensei or uh, sensei or drill sergeant kind of top down instruction? What what is that? style like because we can only see so much from the outside obviously and the three of us get to work close to the league but as a player as the captain you would have the best understanding of what that relationship is like i mean he's i want to say big brother little brother i mean he's he's our coach and i think we have a lot of trust in him but just me as a as a player um obviously i've had a little bit of a different relationship than some of these guys as as i've kind of been there from from the beginning gone off and we never, when I left and, and I was kind of going through my early years of the career, this obviously wasn't necessarily an idea yet. And now coming back, being able to work with him, he's someone I've always, I've always trusted and I've had a big belief in, uh, he's believed in me and I just, I don't know. I, I respect him. I respect what he does as a coach. I respect how he comes, comes into work every day and handles himself and, and just how prepared he is and how demanding he is. And some ways he's, we kind of see the game in the same way. So it's, he's easy to work with. What kind of coach is he? I mean, we, we see so many different coaches in different sports and uh, how they interact with players and how they interact with the media. And I don't think anybody can say there's one way that leads to championships, but is he, you know, more of a say little authoritarian type? Is he more of the after training, come and put his arm around you after yelling at you all training? Is he, you know, what, how does he go about his business to get everybody on board? I think it's just in terms of how prepared he is and I think as players you can only you whether you admit it or not when you first kind of interact with him you you just you learn that he's very demanding in what he wants but he's doing all the stuff himself right he's he's putting in the hours he's he's prepared he's doing the homework to put ourselves in the best in the best position he's by no means a guy who's going to show up on the field and and rant and rave and throw his arms in the air um he by all kinds, when, it, when it's bad like that, he kind of goes quiet and he, and he hopes that we're kind of going to figure it out internally. I think he, he knows when he needs to blow up. Uh, we don't really see it too often, which is, which is great. But uh, um, yeah, man, he's, he doesn't really miss much, whether it's on the field or off the field. So you can't say he's not tuned in. And I think guys just kind of see that work ethic and, and it translates into, into what we all want to do. Well, what were you guys you... like? Sorry, Sorry I'm just that. quickly. What were you guys like before the finals? Were you like dialed in, intense, or really relaxed and laid back? What what kind of mood was Bobby trying to get across when when you're going into those games? Um, the first leg. So leading up to the first leg, you could kind of sense in the in that week leading up to it because our schedule had been so hectic leading up to those last kind of two two games that everyone kind of had like a chance to catch their breath, and it was sort of like we almost wished it was right away and we had what was it like a week 10 days to yeah. to lead up to that um and in those first sessions i feel like there was a little bit of tension a little bit of anxiety leading up to it and then the day before the session we had was just everyone kind of for whatever reason whether everyone just kind of like took a breath and was like let's enjoy this but 
that session, I, I don't know if you guys remember, because I think a lot of you guys were on the sideline, was it was so laid back. It was, it was, everyone was in a, in a good mood. Everyone was excited. And it didn't really feel like anyone was all pent up, let's say, before the, like it was before the very first game, the inaugural match, mm-hmm. where we talked about it, we talked about it, and no one really knew what we were going to get. Everyone knew that there was going to be a good crowd. We knew who we were facing. We knew we were prepared. So it was like, let's just go out and do the business. So it was, by all accounts, very laid back. Everyone was joking. Music was going before the, before the session started. Music was going after, and everyone kind of just wanted to roll the ball out there and get after it. No, I think that's absolutely spot on. I do remember being on the touchline for that and just going like, this seems way too casual for the first. <laughs> you would think that there'd be a little bit of um, more nerves, but it, a lot of it probably boiled down to you knew your opponent inside and out. You knew your team inside and out. It was just, like you said, a matter of let's get to the game and, and get it going. They knew, Johnny Grant. They, knew, they knew Johnny Grant was starting up top. That's why. <laughs> yeah, we had a couple aces up our sleeve, so we're all right. Only a few minutes left here, Kyle, but I want to make sure I got to this question from the YouTube chat. It comes from B. Colts, and he wants to know which MLS side you would rather beat in the Canadian Championship more, the Impact or TFC? It's easy. Uh, yeah, TFC. <laughs> there you go, B. Colt. I think I wonder if he was wondering if there was a bit of uh, we want to dethrone the champs, but TFC makes, I think, a little bit way, way too much sense for you, Kyle Becker. That was an easy one um lastly in a short answer just maybe one thing that stood out to you but from what you remember what on earth happened with the deltas you mentioned it earlier in the show but you you win the bowl in your inaugural season and then the club folds what uh, what sticks out to you and and maybe some insight that no one knows about that situation um yeah we the one thing we all knew it was essentially done so the folding itself wasn't really a surprise i think Maybe in the back of some people's minds, they thought if we won, they'd figure it out and, and we'd stick around. But I'd say like 90, 99% of the team was like, this is all she wrote. Let's just go out with a win. And this is going to be the weirdest story of all time. And that's really all it was the whole year. It was just uh, just bizarre. Looking back on it, it's just, it seems made up, but it's hilarious to be a part of that. Well, why was it bizarre? Why was it bizarre, though? You keep on you you keep on alluding to a few things here, and I think you're well, holding I mean, back. I think you're holding back just a little bit. How long do we got? The whole thing. Was just... <laughs> Ninety seconds. <laughs> oh yeah, let's go. We'll have you on again. We'll have to, you... It's like start to finish. It was like showed up. Our locker room was a storage container, essentially in a public park. There was like a parks and rec department that worked there that would kick us off the field more times than not. So we'd have to take vans to a turf field to go train. Yet we had a coach like Mark DeSantos who treated us like we were Real Madrid. So it was just whether it was the I think the majority of the group was relatively older. We we had some experience. So I think that helped uh, in a large part where it was kind of just let's get on with it and do the business. Um, at some point during the season, we played a, a game that was on our turf or our practice field, which I, I can't stress enough was a public park <laughs> because the NASL wouldn't come in like check it out and like approve it they just took our word for it because they were trying to get us to forfeit the game it was when miami had all those like hurricanes and tornadoes something there was a little break in season and they wouldn't send people out to check it out they wanted us to essentially hand over the game we're like no we have a place to play so we played a game there which was just chaos that that happened like miami's team and nesta were getting tra- changed outside there was no locker room. They got changed I forgot. Outside. I forgot Nesta was there. That's a great. Yeah. It was. It was a bizarre world, man. And then, yeah, just the the people surrounding the club were hilarious, and just all the ins and outs. That's that's a good summer because I'm sure there's a whole lot more we can go on. I want to ask you two rapid fire, and I mean, like, as first thing that comes to mind. If you don't remember the best answer, that's fine. I'll forgive you for it. Don't worry. The favorite kit you have ever owned from a team you played for. Team I played for. A TFC kit was pretty nice. Was you, weren't you there when they had the Canadian flag on it, kind of? Yeah, that was the best yeah, the red one. Had. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, I'll go national team. National team. That's that's a good uh, answer. And worst pitch you ever played on in North America? The one I just said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wanted. To, I figured that was going to be the answer, but I wanted to make sure. It was unbelievable. <laughs> well, Kyle, this has been a very fun hour with you thank you very much for coming on we hope everyone enjoyed it uh, the programming does not stop here tonight though one soccer happy hour as i alluded to earlier janine becky manchester city women's 
player and Canadian national team member will join Andy, Carm, and Laura. So tune in for that one. That is at, uh, make sure I got the time right because I don't want to mess this one up. 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific. I think I said 5.30 earlier, but 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific. Uh, the Hangout is back tomorrow with Asa. Julian Buescher will be joining the show at the same time, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And uh, go vote on the One Soccer Bracket if you haven't already done so. Speaking of housekeeping, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and you liked the video. Like the video if you liked it. And we will talk to you later on the One Soccer Happy Hour and the Hangout. For Kurt, for Ollie, for Kyle, and the other Kyle, producer Kyle, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll chat with you all soon.